One of who will speak about some very interesting applications of the Qt algorithm to much theory. Yeah. Hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Z for giving me the opportunity to have a talk here. And uh, I will start with basic introduction to knot theory, since I do not assume any knowledge in this topic. And uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you, if you have questions or want me to clarify some of it. So, <clears throat> what is a knot? A knot is a map, smooth map from S1 to S3. And actually, if uh, there uh, we know that there is at least one point in S3 which doesn't belong to the image of S1, so we can replace it with R. That's basically the same. And if we, in, uh, we can consider uh, several components. Uh, this will be called a link. Uh, a link is, a, for example, two-component link is two maps from S1 to R3. So everyone uh, has an experience with knots or links from everyday life. So let, let's look at, at some example. The first, uh, the first and the simplest example of a knot is the so-called unknot, simply of loop. And uh, <coughs> the <coughs> smallest example of the non-trivial knot is the so-called trefoil knot. Transformation from this to this. So I told two uh, uh, knots equivalent if there is a smooth uh, deformation by S3 which transforms one map to another. Also, we can pick an orientation for the map. Then it's called an oriented knot. And to conclude the basic introduction, I will draw a picture of the small of the small slip which is a hop flank, just two rings linked together. So, uh, people started to classify such pictures. And actually, simply by drawing diagrams, people came to uh, knots uh, with uh, 11 crossings. I mean, uh, but this is not a very efficient way to do that. So, uh, uh, when, when we talk about the, uh, something in three-dimensional space, it's hard to analyze. So what people like is the two-dimensional picture. And actually what I wrote here is a two-dimensional picture, which is called a knot diagram. Uh, but it's clear that for a single knot, there are multiple knot diagrams. So uh, 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 it is the first question of uh, a representation, a knot in the form of two-dimensional diagram to answer when two diagrams correspond to the same knot. So, uh, let's now look closely at the diagram. So, if we see this part, this is equivalent to a straight line, right? If we'll see this type of intersection, <coughs> double intersection, it is equivalent to two parallel lines. And the less trivial example is that if we see this type of triple intersection, then it's equivalent
I can see that we move this simply through the crossing. And the surprising fact is actually that any two equivalent two-dimensional diagram of the same knot can be related uh, to each other uh, via the composition of these, th these three moves. It's a theorem. Meister. So these are called Rademeister type 1 move, Rademeister type 2 move, and Rademeister type 3 move. So at this point, uh, we know, uh, we at least uh, described uh, what to uh, which mean, what means that two diagrams correspond to the same knot in the terms of Rademeister move. But, however, this is not an algorithmic approach, since uh, uh, if we have two dimensional, uh, uh, two two dimensional diagrams, then we can only use brute force uh, and Rademeister move to show that they are equivalent. So, uh, <clears throat> the next step, oh, it doesn't build up. <laughs> okay. I will talk for a while. <laughs> so the next step uh, is to uh, construct a knot invariant. What is a knot invariant? It is a function of two-dimensional diagram, which should be equivalent for all two-dimensional diagram which correspond to the same knot. With the help of randomized remove to show that some function of two-dimensional diagram is a knot invariant, we need to prove only that it's invariant under randomized removes. But, uh, <clears throat> so, okay. <clears throat> but the fact that uh, two two-dimensional diagrams have the same knot invariant doesn't necessarily mean that co they correspond to the same knot. So the idea of uh, uh, the uh, study of knot invariants <coughs> is to construct the ultimate knot invariant, which will be equivalent for any uh, two-dimensional diagram of the same knot and will distinguish all different knots. And it appears that the most efficient way is the so-called polynomial knot invariants. They still open to find one. What? They don't exist. Uh, yeah, I, I will talk a bit about it a little bit later. The first example dates to 1928, and it's Alexander Polynomials. Of course, uh, they, are, they cannot distinguish all two different knots. And a huge step was made in the mid-80s. Uh, and it's Jones polynomials. These are polynomials in one variable. And later, the Alexander polynomials and Jones polynomials were unified in the so-called Homsted polynomials. I will not define these polynomials as I unfortunately don't have time for that. Uh, the Homsted is the first letter of so of original paper. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and now uh, the whole flip polynomials are the most efficient way for, for the present day to distinguish all knots. They are different uh, for, all, for almost all knots which people classified. There are known only one pair of knots uh, in, uh, with 11 crossings, which cannot be distinguished by, by conflict polynomials. So, <clears throat> it's not known if there are any exceptions. It's still open, right? Yeah, it's still open. So, the, uh, it, is, it, is not, it is not a problem. So, uh, but but there, there is a conjecture that some generalization of 
conflict lunar nodes, which are called colored conflict lunar nodes. You can distinguish all type of nodes. Uh, and now we know that, for example, they distinguish uh, those which conflict lunar nodes do not distinguish. And to proceed with that... Uh, yeah, I want to buy the so-called Basiliev. Uh, are there any better? Mm. Basiliev invariants uh, are included in the conflict lunar nodes. You can evaluate them from, from Hoffman, actually. That's... Uh, so, uh, I was talking about two-dimensional diagram, but for the oriented knot, we can uh, go further and we can consider a specific type of two-dimensional diagram, which is called a braid. What is a braid? A braid of n strands uh, is, the, is the following object. So we consider n strands and we intersect which are oriented in the same direction. And we intersect uh, at each step the, uh, the neighboring pair. So we can do it this way, and so on. And in the end, we take the closure of the braid, which means this uh, connects with first, connects with first, and so on. This is called a braid. If we consider two braid and use the operation of composition, uh, then we can know that uh, the braids form a group with respect to composition. So what is the uh, uh, inverse? That, uh, it's trivial what is uh, the identity, and the inverse is uh, simply when we consider the reverse intersection. For example, if we had the last intersection of the first braid in this form, then we can take this type of intersection. When we attach them and use the Rademeister type to move, we get identity. <clears throat> so any element has an inverse. And this is a break. Break group can be defined formally in terms of relations. So what are uh, the generators of the break group? These are elementary intersections. Uh, for example, if we have n-strand break group, then we have n minus 1 generators. I will call them Ti. So clearly from the Rademeister, uh, oh, and I forgot to say that uh, this is, this is an, uh, we have two types of intersection, undercrossing and overcrossing. But like we call T, Ti and Ti prime. But from the randomizer type to move, we know that Ti prime is actually Ti inverse. <clears throat> now consider the randomizer type 3 move. Here we go that the first trend simply goes under, under the crossing of the second and the third. So we can either cross it to them after or before. So what does it mean in terms of generators? This means that Ti, Ti plus 1, Ti equals to Ti plus 1, Ti, Ti plus 1. And clearly they are commute uh, if Ti j equals to j i if i minus j is greater than 1. So if we look at this relations, uh, and for example, if we uh, consider one additional relation, say the square is identity, what do we get? Which are no dead constructions. <laughs> Symmetrically. 
one here. Right. We will get the symmetric group. So to prevent this happen, <laughs> we add the pi squared as some deformation of the symmetric group, where q is some parameter. We know that at q equals 1 is simply the symmetric group. Uh, so this is the quite efficient way uh, n. And of course, there is a theorem that we can present uh, all uh, not in the form of the braid closure. It can, it can be a large braid, but anyway, it, it always exists. It is a theorem. So uh, now we want to evaluate some objects with the help of the braid. So what to write? Oh, again, I used the lower time for it. What to write suggested is to associate with uh, each strand a vector space, finite dimensional vector space. Then for the element ti, uh, <clears throat> there is a linear operator from the tensor product of two vector space to the tensor product of two other vector space. And yes. <clears throat> and we, if we consider uh, v as a Q graded vector spaces, then we will get the Hopfit polynomials. Now, the idea how to generalize it consider uh, some finite dimensional representation of GLN in V. And actually, there is a theorem that uh, the T will respect the irreducible components of the representation. How can I dig? Not, not to dig into details. <laughs> uh, okay. So this, this allows us to, in some sense, the color each strand with a irreducible representation of GLN. And this will give us the more refined polynomial. So if we're given a knot diagram, and we're given uh, some young uh, diagram which parameterizes the representation of GLN, we will get the so-called colored Hopfit polynomial. And there is a conjecture that colored Hopfit polynomials can distinguish all knots. Uh, at least there is no known pair of knots which they cannot distinguish. The colored Hopfit polynomials is not a single polynomial for a knot. It's the whole series uh, for different Young diagrams. This is the fundamental one where it corresponds with usual Hopfit polynomials. Second symmetric, second anti-symmetric, and so on. So, if two knots are different, then at least one will differ in that series. This doesn't necessarily mean that each colored Hopfit polynomial will differ, uh, <clears throat> but at least one will differ. So,
though this is the simplest example of knots which cannot be distinguished by uh, the usual Holmes-Lipp polynomial. And actually, there is a theorem that the colored Holmes-Lipp polynomial for all symmetric and anti-symmetric representation will be the same for this knots. But the first not trivial example is this one. But people, uh, however, are unable to evaluate it so far. Well, people accept me. <laughs> that, so uh, what, what was actually done, uh, that uh, Morton, in the beginning of 2000, I guess, proved that the difference of the uh, color concept level for this representation and these two knots is not zero, without evaluating. That, that, that was a quite <laughs> interesting paper. So uh, the interesting uh, uh, problem was to actually evaluate and compare it. And to do this, we had to develop uh, the cabling technique for the colored homefluent polynomials. So uh, what's the idea? The idea is that actually T operators for colored Hopfle polynomials look uh, very easy if we consider uh, irreducible representation of the tensor pair. But when we try to go to other pair, which is practically a di different basis on the whole tensor product, uh, the, <clears throat> the main issue is to rewrite uh, irreducible components of, for example, V1 tensor V2 in terms of irreducible components of V2 tensor V3 and basis on the complement. That's so what my collaborators in ITP did, they developed uh, a basis uh, for the whole tensor product which makes the uh, operators T simple. I will say just a few words how this basis is constructed. Suppose we have uh, a young diagram with n boxes. Let me say three. Oh. Okay. Then the element of a basis is actually a path from. Now I know that the difference is not zero. 
So By you have direct the energy work that you, you could calculate the difference? Uh, yes. So yes. yes. So you have a new proof that it's not zero. Yeah. 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 Well, so, of course, the most interesting application of this will be the evaluation directly of both of them. That's the, however, I, I did it still. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> okay, so, but this is not the only application of this method. The most important application was that uh, then we went to the hopefully uh, polynomials of the links, which were not evaluated before. So I will strike. Uh, I, I will start with the review of the uh, structure of Hopfler polynomials for the knots. This, this, these are the formulas which which were known before, but uh, they they help to uh, they, they help to understand the structure. Uh, the Gerfelidis uh, noted that uh, the Conflict polynomials for the twisted links can be presented as a Q hypergeometric series. And here the bracket is simply x minus 1 over x. So those of you who are familiar with Q hypergeometric series will recognize it here in, in that sum. And there is, no, there is no general statement. We do not know whether the all Hopefully, polynomials and symmetric representation can be rewritten in that form, because to find it, it's it's quite 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 a problem, usually. Uh, but this one was known for the symmetric representation. Oh, for the symmetric and unsymmetric representations uh, in the case of twist knots. What is the twist knot? Uh, and it's k times. And then what we do in the end, we do the twist. I would like to stress that this is not this is not actually a braid because they go in the opposite directions. So the braid for the twist knot is quite large. But in some sense, the twist knots are the simple ones. They parameterize with one k, and this is k here. So what can we do with the Q hypergeometric series? From Professor Z fundamental work, <laughs> we know that for any uh, Q hypergeometric series, we can find a linear recursive relation. So, if we have Hopfler polynomial uh, of some knot, twisted knot K, in symmetric representation with R boxes, this is simpler. This. Then we know that it satisfies some linear recurrence relations, which means that. A R and actually, well, actually there is three terms here, but in general it can be more. In the very beginning, people thought that. This is the way to evaluate Hopfler polynomials in higher representations. But actually, it never works <laughs> this way. People always construct the Q hypergeometric series and then get the linear recurrence relations. Uh, but they are still important. They are still important uh, due to the uh, application in symplectic geometry. For example, if we consider the complement of a knot in S3, so we take the S3, then we cut the knot. We will get some uh, 